On the screen, uh, Stephen has probably put up by now this Romans uh, 3, uh, verses 20 and 21. And uh, I'll, I'll let you read that yourself. I won't read that. The, the statement, the, this particular statement by Paul, though, that's the core of his letter. Uh, he spent the first two and a half chapters bringing his readers to the, to this point. And, and what we need to do is take a look at this from a couple of different perspectives. Uh, salvation by faith in Christ is encapsulated in this statement by Paul. It's revolutionary, and, and it's difficult to grasp. Even Christians have a hard time with this. It's, it's uh, very much against the nature of the flesh. Okay. Uh, in fact, to unbelieving Jews, it's just, it's outrageous. What? Yeah. Uh, what do you mean? What do you mean? You, you, you can't be justified by keeping the, what do you mean you, you can't, by saying that you can't be justified by keeping the deeds of the law? What is that? Uh, you know, doing, uh, doing the law is the only way to earn justification. Everybody knows that, you know. And, and by the way, that's true. That's true. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the only way to earn being justified before God is by keeping the law. See, that's the truth. We all believe that. You want to earn your righteousness? You keep the law. You know, uh, all Christians believe that. And for that matter, you know, non-Christians believe that too. You know, and so Paul says, well, give it your best shot. Go ahead. It's not going to work because nobody does it. You know, the very best that keeping the law can do is to make a person realize that he can't keep the law, that he's, that he's a sinner. You know, that, that's all it does for us. Um, do you see that last phrase in verse 20, for by the law, that's up in verse 20 there. It says, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's what the law does for us. And it does for anyone who's honest with themselves. If you're honest with yourself, you go, yeah, I don't really. I mean, we talk about that at the Lord's table all the time. See, no matter, no matter what, none of us keep the law. In other words, we sin all the time. You know, the Apostle John said, you know, sin's the transgression of the law. Okay. So for two and a half uh, 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 chapters and a chunk of chapter three, here we are. Uh, keeping the law doesn't work, so what's left? What's left? And what's left, though, is, is verse 21. That's what's left. Uh, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Uh, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, it was, it was prophesied that this was going to happen. And so right here, see, is where unbelievers are outraged and most Christians choke. That is the phrase, without the law. Now look, they say, how in the world can a person be saved if he doesn't do the deeds of the law? I, I, really, I mean... What if he doesn't keep the greatest commandment? You know, the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with everything he had. That's great. What if you don't do that? Uh, love your neighbors yourself. We have a hard time with that one. You know, I got some neighbors. No, I'm not supposed to love them, right? But, you know, but my eyes wiggle when I say, when I say that. Hey, you know, and more to the point, what if I don't keep the commandments? You know, like no stealing, no parking in the handicap zones. You know, that's really a mean thing to do. You know, but, but you, you know, I, I avoid it for the sake of the ticket, but if I could get away with it, I might, you know, sometimes. Uh, no cheating in business, no gossiping, you know, gossiping is a sin, no gossiping. You know, all those sins that Paul described, a, a, you know, in chapter one of, of the book of Romans, a whole stack of them, the chapter that ended with a comment after he went, the, you know, after he described all those sins, and the chapter ends with a comment, you know, the people that do these things are worthy of death, right? You know, that's me too. See, so, so Paul, you know, well, he couldn't really have meant what he said about being righteous even if he didn't keep the law. That, that can't be right. That, that, you know, not really. Uh, he must have pushed the wrong keys on his work processor when he wrote that, right? You know, that's, that's got to be a mistake, you know. But he's, you know, uh, he couldn't have meant his, his words to be taken literally. You know what that would do? That would open the door to people sinning all they wanted and still expecting to be saved, and that can't be right. Oh. See, and so not only that, people would be, uh, Paul, if this gospel of Paul's, they would be making God out to not only not take sins into account at all, that would be kind of an ollie ollie auction free, you know, <laughs> do what you want, 
of that kind of thing. God, he would become an enabler of sin, and that can't be right. God hates sin. He's not going to let it slide. Yeah. So, so people back then, you know, they mocked Paul for his gospel. They laughed at him. And, and Paul mentioned that in Romans 3 and 8. He says, and not rather, and here it comes, you know, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, that's what they were saying, he said, come, let us do evil, that good may come. You know, whose damnation is just? They're going to get theirs. Okay. I didn't say that. That's what Paul was saying. I didn't say that. That's not what I'm saying here. Well, if he didn't say that, what did he mean? What's he getting at? How's this work? See, one possibility is that, and, and I think a lot of Christians go this way, maybe what Paul meant is that first you have to believe in Jesus, and then you have to keep the law in order to be saved. Some kind of law. Uh, you know, that's got to be it. You know, a lot of Christians believe that, that, that a Christian really can just stop sinning. And once more, the word is, give it your best shot. I, I don't know of any, you know, but... I know some claim that, you know, but really, it's got to be faith. See, what Paul said was, what the words are without the law. You got to, you know, that, that's, how are you going to pull that off? How are you going to do that? See, it, the conundrum is that if the weakness of the law is the flesh, that's Romans 8, 3, it was weak through the flesh, then that is, if the law can't say because it's the nature of man to sin, to not do the law, on the one hand, right, that forces God to, that forces God to judge and condemn sinners. On the other hand, though, there is another hand. If 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 God doesn't require obedience to the law or some kind of law to be saved, then doesn't that make God an accessory to the crime? That is, He enables all law breaking because He doesn't judge the guilty, right? And so, what happens is that God becomes unholy. If he does that, he can't do that. Okay. And so God, he's stuck between a rock and a hard place. If he judges according to the law, we can't be saved. If God refuses to count our, uh, count our sins against us, like King David, like I just read, you know, at the table, then God becomes unrighteous, as unrighteous as the ones that he's excusing. So we make God unrighteous. See? So the law can't save us. And the gospel that Paul is preaching makes God an accessory to sin. Well, now what? Now what? And there's one other thing, too, I'll mention. Adding faith in Christ to keeping the law in order to earn salvation, that's just smoke and mirrors. You know, we stay in the same place as before if you try that. Okay. Still don't do the law, and we keep on sinning anyway. So the question remains, now what? Now what? What happens now? See, and the reason that this is a problem for so many Christians but basically, they come down on the side of adding Christ to the law. That's what happens. See, is the reason that they do that is because they don't read the first gospel call on the day of Pentecost all the way through. you got to read it all the way through. Peter pointed to the bridge over the gap between the gospel and the practice of the gospel in his, in his gospel call. Okay? in his first public speech after the Holy Ghost had fallen on the church, see, on the day of Pentecost. Now, remember what happened on the day of Pentecost. You know, that they're all together, the disciples are, and suddenly there's this big rushing sound of a mighty wind and tongues of fire on their heads, and, and it was noisy. It was so noisy that people around started running over to where those guys were, where the disciples were. And they found them, you know, speaking in tongues, and everybody heard the... the you know, their own languages and all that. And and, uh, and some of them said, well, you guys, these guys are drunk. <laughs> you know, that's what's happening. And Peter said, no, no, that's not what that is. See, he quoted out of Joel 2, 28 to 32, about God pouring out his spirit on all flesh. Okay, and, and that's what you guys are seeing. That's what's happening right here. Okay. And so Peter, see, he uses the very last phrase in verse 32 of Joel 2. 32, as they use that passage to introduce the gospel. And so this is in Acts 2, 22 and 23. And he goes on, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. That's the name that, that we're going to introduce here, Jesus of Nazareth. And so he goes on, he is proved of God. Uh, you know, you guys saw it, you saw the miracles, you saw the, the, uh, the mighty works, you saw, uh, 
you know, the signs that he did, raising people from the dead and all that. You saw all that stuff. And not only that, in verse 23, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands you crucified him. The man, uh, this man was the prophesied Christ, and y'all have killed him. Whoa, whoa. See, so you take a look. That's what the that's what, that's where it was. That's where they went. And they were, oh no, oh no, we're up a creek. You see their eyes wiggling. We killed the Christ. And so when they heard this, see, this is in 37 through 39. They were pricked in their heart. They thought, oh Peter, they, hey, you know, they, and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, brothers, <laughs> you know, they, uh, these are murderers, brothers. What are we gonna do now? We're stuck, you know, and so, you know, so Peter's, here comes the gospel call. This is it. Repent. This is 238. We all know how it works. Uh, Peter said to them, repent, you guys, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, who you killed, but in his name anyway, for the remission of sins. And here comes the part that we need to take a look at today. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You remember Rod, how amazed he was when he finally came to that realization. He wanted to preach here, and he did. Came up, and he was, oh, got something to tell you, right? Well, we already knew. But anyway, it was nice to hear him. <laughs> Good to see Rod. For the promise is unto you, to your kids, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. See, the thing is that most Christians, especially in the Church of Christ, you know, we tend to, to stop reading at that phrase, for the remission of sins. We kind of lose interest in the rest of it. Remission of sins. Well, that's that's key, all right. We, we want our sins remitted. Yeah, I certainly do. See? And, and, but remember, when we were kids, see, we were trained to lose interest in what follows after for the remission of sins. We were trained to, to, to not look. You know, and, and the reason we were was because our parents were trained, and their parents were trained that way. You know, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. In other words, see, the gift of the Holy Ghost is for every single Christian in every land, in every time. That's a promise. The church never had the right to claim that the gift of the Spirit was only for the time of the apostles. That wasn't true. Peter denied it explicitly. He said, that's not right. And so as we looked at, at last week, the gift of the Holy Ghost is generally, but not always, given upon baptism. We were looking at that. And also, as we looked at last week, the gift of the Holy Ghost isn't actually an option. That just happens. You know, uh, you know we, we don't get to choose whether to accept or reject the gift of the Spirit of God. When we get baptized, when we believe in Christ, we come up out of the water... It's ours. He is here. And that is the way it is. And there's a reason why that is. There's a reason why the gift of the Holy Ghost isn't an option for Christians. See, what happens is, without that gift, I mean, without the gift, without the Holy Ghost, without the regeneration brought about by the Holy Ghost, see, the promise of being righteous without the deeds of the law, that really would truly and genuinely be an open invitation by God for people to engage in unrestrained sin. That's exactly what it would mean, okay? But it's the presence of God the Spirit that prevents just that. He works against that. Doesn't let us do that. See, a lot of Christians feared that that's what Paul was preaching. See, they didn't realize the part that the Holy Ghost has in all this. The Holy Ghost is critical to the outworking of the Christian life. Got to have the Holy Ghost here. But Christians, see, they judge each other without considering at all the fact that the Holy Ghost has to be present in each and every true believer. And it's that fact that makes everything else work. That's what makes it all work together. He's not just a helper. You know, he's not just one who helps us pray. He does. He's not just one who gives different gifts to different people. He does that. Uh, the most fundamental work of the Holy Ghost, though, is the new creation, the new creature. That work 
that he does in the Christian is no less a miracle than when the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary and she was found with Christ. And up on the screen, you're going to see some passages and you can read them. I'm not going to because it's kind of long here. So read them yourself. Okay. Ye must be born again, said Jesus. And that new birth is accomplished by God himself. And it's accomplished only for those who believe on the name of Jesus. It's restrictive. But it is instantly accomplished for those who do believe on the name of Jesus. It is the new birth that makes the gospel with all of its promise of forgiveness of all sins. It makes it possible. Such a promise, it couldn't be extended to those who are unregenerated, those who are reprobate, those who, those people would inevitably, they would inevitably abuse that freedom without remorse, without fear, without sorrow, without repentance. That's what would happen. Got to have the new birth. But just as inevitably, those who are born again, they'll, sometimes they'll experience a, a broken fellowship with the Father. And they will experience remorse. They will learn to fear sin, just as we do. They will come to sorrow over sin. Ah, wish I hadn't done that. Wish I'd done the other. Then they will so repent of their sins under the chastisement of God. That's Hebrews 12 and 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. That's right. And we, we know about that. We've been there, most of us. All right. Well, does he chastise us or does he not chastise? They, you know, the Bible says he does. And don't think he don't, you know, don't think he won't. Uh, he, that's, you know, our personal experience, you know, bears that out. Yes, he will. That's right. Okay. Hey, you know, it's as if people thought that the Holy Ghost is just, that he was here for the ride. Uh, that he, that he, he's just here to take notes of all our sins and go, mm, oh, that's bad. That's not what the Holy Ghost does. You know, he's God. He's God Almighty. He exercises all that God Almighty power in the interest of those he's given birth to, including rebuking and chastising. He does that. See, but because we've been trained to not even believe in the Holy Ghost, that the Holy Ghost is present with us anymore, why would anybody believe that uh, he really does chastise? So what happens then in that case, what happens is people judge sending Christians as being lost. Up, oh, send, lost. And just like that, right? Okay. And they never give a thought that God may be doing his chastising work this second in that person. He is sending Christian. But if the Holy Ghost is in him, you can bet that he's feeling it. That's going on. That's happening right now. So we wait. Wait and see, you know, what, what God brings out of all. It's guaranteed this guy's going to repent sooner or later. In other words, see, we, we've been trained to exhibit no faith in the operation of the Holy Spirit. You know, we've been trained to, to just not believe that he's here, that he's truly working. The Bible calls it, you know what the Bible calls it? It calls it quenching the Spirit. That needs to stop. Okay. You know what? We can grieve the Spirit. Uh, we can quench the Spirit. We can't drive them away and because the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. That's Romans 11 and 29. So here's how everything gets put together. This is the way we're going to put it together now. When a person comes to faith in Christ and he's baptized, he's given the gift of the Holy Ghost. And by that miracle, he becomes a new man. That's what happens. New man. And not later and not sometime in the future, but that second. Okay, this moment. What happens then is a believer now has, he's stuck with it. He's stuck with two natures. We've talked about this before too. The old man of sin, which is housed in the body of corruption, that's our present bodies, and the new man of the spirit, who's looking forward to the resurrection of the new body, you know, the spiritual body. You know, and so the battle between the two natures ensues. We know how that is. We're always fighting ourselves, right? Okay. Sometimes the old man wins. We know how that is. Sometimes he wins a lot, and for a long time, that happens. That happens to Christians. Paul describes the struggle, though, in, in Romans 7, 11 through 25. And you know how it goes. For the good that I would do, that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do, and so on. You know, we know how this passage goes. 
This struggle itself isn't even possible without the new birth and the presence of the Spirit. You know, the old man's not going to struggle against himself. You know, he's just going to go on his merry way. The only reason for the struggle is the presence of the new man. That's why we fight it. Okay. So here's Paul's conclusion then in Romans 7 and 25. I thank God. Actually, it's Romans 7 and 25 and then Romans 8 and 1 too. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, here's the way it works. With the mind, I myself, the genuine me, the, resur the, the regenerated me, the new man, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, sometimes I sin. Okay? There is therefore now, therefore, because of that, there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, you remember back in chapter 7, I just mentioned this. Paul's describing the struggle between the two natures. So walking after the Spirit doesn't mean that we don't sin. It's not true. It does mean that we believe in Jesus and that we are born again. And we are engaged in the struggle against sin by the faith of Christ and by the indwelling Spirit. See, we are new creatures. The old man's still kicking. You know, we know that. You know what John said, though, about it? And John the Apostle emphasized it this way in 1 John 3 and 9. This is a scary verse. Listen to this. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, the Spirit, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. What? This is a pretty bold statement. Whosoever is born of God doesn't sin, and what's more, he can't even sin. He can't. This is what John said. A true Christian doesn't even have the ability to sin. Why did he get that? Whoa, oh, you know, you know what? You can't, what? He, he wasn't, John wasn't senile. You know, he didn't forget what he wrote in chapter 1. 1 John 1, through 8, 1 and 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us. Right? And then he goes in, in chapter 3, he says this. Well, you can't even sin if you're a Christian. You know, John's speaking of the two natures, just like Paul was. In the new man, in the spirit, we serve God. We don't sin. We serve God. We want to do his will. You know, if and when we sin, we condemn the sin. We condemn. Oh, man. Because the moment we put on Christ, we've condemned the old man's sin. As soon as you turn away from the old man's sin to Jesus, you're condemning the old man's sin and everything he stood for. That's kind of a given. That's what you're doing. That's why you get baptized in the first place. We've repented of the old man. I'm sorry. He's still there, but we repented of it. Now, none of this is possible without the gift of the Holy Ghost. See, life under the new covenant just isn't possible without the new birth. You can't do it. And that's why there's so much emphasis on the Holy Ghost in the New Testament. See, for some, here's the practicalities. Here's the way it works out. It's like, how much sin can a Christian do before he goes to hell? Well, actually... You're the temple of the Holy Ghost. Nobody can send you to hell. And God won't, and nobody else can. That's the way it works. Okay. As far as the number of, consins, of, number of sins are concerned, see, there's no practical limit. Remember what Jesus told Peter. He says, 70 times 7. You've got to forgive him 70 times 7 per day at a minimum. Well, that was just for us. How much will God forgive us? How long can a Christian wait to confess his sins before God's going to uh, condemn him? I don't know that a, a limit's ever mentioned in the Bible. Uh, Romans 8, 33, check that out. And you know when God actually does forgive a Christian of sin? Uh, he, he did that about, about 1,987 years ago. <laughs> Your sins were forgiven on the cross. We even sing the song, they are nailed to the cross, they are nailed to the cross, right? That's past tense, and that's exactly correct, past tense. But when does a Christian experience that forgiveness? That's a different question altogether. Okay? Uh, you know, that happens when he confesses his sins. You know, fellowship with the Father is restored at that point. Okay? And how long may a Christian sin a deep sin before he becomes aware that he's lost the fellowship with the Father? In most cases, it's instantly, <laughs> right now. Right now. Hey, you know, by experience, this is my experience, okay? The Bible doesn't say it. But I'll tell you this, that when the conscious decision 
to yield to sin is made, that fellowship quits instantly. You feel abandoned by God already. You know that because you're already hiding from God. The second you think, I'm going to go ahead and do this, even though I know God doesn't like it, right? That fellowship is broken that moment. You're on your own. And you feel it. Christians feel it. You know, that's the difference between intentional and unintentional sin, the loss of fellowship. You know, we, we sin all the time. We're not even aware of it. God's still here with us. But when you deliberately sin, see, you're deliberately going against the fellowship, the, the, the walk between you and the Father. At that point, that's broken. You know, still saved, but you are out there in the cold. And you're not, you know, you're not talking to God anymore. Just like David did, you know, when he had Bathsheba, he wouldn't even go to the temple. You know, the foremost part of uh, the for, foremost work of the Spirit, though, is the new birth. That's the first thing. Then the focus is Christ and Him crucified, not the Spirit. You know, the, the focus of the Spirit is on Jesus. Okay, and then that's where we're supposed to be all the time. And then the process of growing us in Christ that happens, and then the instructions on what is sin. That's where the law comes in. Oh yeah, I shouldn't have done that. You know, the, you know, he enlightens the Bible to us. Oh, yeah, you know how it is when you're reading the Bible, all of a sudden something's standing out in bold print. Oh, I never saw that before. That's the Holy Spirit. You're not being smart. That's God. Okay. You know, he, he points out our character flaws. He points us to opportunities to serve. He, he you know, he gives us spiritual gifts, and, and he disciplines us. That's part of it. That's Hebrews 12 and 6. So here's the thing, and here's the deal. Some of us lead exemplary lives. I mean, there's Christians that I look and I go, oh man, I don't think this guy ever sins. You know, I see that. Uh, I mean, they're really straight up. And some of us, we, of course, we're judging from the outside. We don't know what goes on inside, right? Okay. You know, but, uh, and some of us, they're a little less so. And, and some of us, even less so. And some of us lead lives that are just pretty blemished by sin. That happens too. See, the cutoff point isn't the amount of sin or the lack thereof. Yeah, you know, that, that can be evidence. But the cutoff point is the presence or the absence of the Holy Ghost. And that's it. Paul, here's Romans 8 and 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The Holy Ghost, if the Holy Spirit isn't, isn't present in a person, he don't belong, belong to Christ. No matter how few sins he does, it doesn't matter. You know, he's not going to save himself by by doing the law, by not sinning. You know, uh, if the Holy Ghost is present, then then all appearances to the contrary, the man's still saved. Well, we can be in doubt. You know, we always look on the outside. We don't know. How would I know if a person, you know, the person who claims to be a believer as the Holy Ghost, if he's really off, you know, running a, you know, the bunny tail ranch in, in Nevada, you know, I have my doubts. <laughs> you know, I don't, but if the Holy Spirit's there, he's going to quit. That's the way it is. Okay. And, uh, I, you know, if any man has the Holy Spirit, no matter how deep the sin that he is in at the moment, he most certainly is going to come to repentance sooner or later. Guaranteed. It's the presence of God and his spirit that allows us such freedom of righteousness without the law. It's the presence of the Spirit that allows that freedom to be entrusted to men. He couldn't otherwise. Unregenerate people cannot live that way. Just can't. It wouldn't work otherwise. Romans 8 and 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ, Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And so now it's time for the invitation. And this is it. You're invited this time to the God who has birthed us by his Holy Ghost. And he has set us free from the yoke of bondage. And that's Galatians 5 and 1. Okay. The